So it looks like we're streaming now. Now I can share this. So that should be fine. Yeah, looks like it's live. Cool. And then in two minutes, I'll hit record. We can use either either one, either this or Discord. I'm looking at both, just in case. And I guess we'll figure it, we'll play by ear and see which is the better of the two. All right, two on the dot. So let's record on this computer. Okay, so welcome everybody to CIS 194, uh, the Windows Client Administration. I call it Windows Part 1 because it comes with a 195, which tends to happen in the spring as it's Part 2. Uh, my name is Irvin. I teach all the cybersecurity courses at Cabrillo. Um, I am a CISSP. I also create and run contests, cybersecurity contests for middle school, high school, and community colleges throughout California, Missouri, and Florida. Uh, this class focuses on mostly uh, the Windows client operating system and Windows Server. It is divided easily into two halves. Uh, the first eight weeks being Windows Client and the second half being the first Windows Server. Uh, it does tie with the MCSA and MCSE certification. So if you're going in that route, that uh, these two or this class helps take care of two of the four certs in that realm. Um, if you are in Canvas, either because you uh, went through my website or you went through Cabrillo, you will have the same exact course. The only difference between the two, well, the two differences is number one, if you're signed up through Cabrillo, you'll get college credit. Uh, and then the other difference is the orientation module. Uh, this is the orientation module for Cabrillo. It the college has a number of things that have to be checked off, whereas mine is just four items. At any point, please feel free to ask questions either using your microphone or using the chat in either here in Zoom or on uh, Discord because I will be, I'll be watching both. Uh, so feel free to ask questions in any, any way. So the Canvas shell in itself is pretty straightforward. 
Uh, we'll be going through a module every week unless I say otherwise, which I know it's true later on in the semester. So for now, we'll do one module a week. You see everything that you'll be doing in that week. And the entire course is visible. So if you feel like you can jump ahead, go for it. There's nothing holding you back. These sessions will run at 2 o'clock every Monday, except next week because it's Labor Day. So we won't be live next Monday, uh, but we'll, we'll through Discord, we'll figure out a time when we can uh, do the next, next module. Uh, so like I said, the first half of the class is all on the Windows client book. And then we hit module six, where we spend a few weeks going through this. And then we pick it up again in module seven with the second half and go all the way down to the end. For the most part, it is very straightforward. This is not meant to be a super complicated course that is hard to navigate, uh, but you will see the exact same thing if you are doing it uh, just following along or actually as a college course through Cabrillo. The other item that I want to show you for this orientation is Discord. Uh, if you've never used it before, it is a uh, it's a platform where you can communicate with others. I'm using it to leverage to communicate uh, for this course. So everybody has access to the announcements, uh, the general, uh, the rules of this. Uh, the news is basically a repeat of anything I put on Twitter. Um, and then anybody who's joining us can, can uh, ask what course to join. Uh, this is the general voice chat where anybody can join and, and talk amongst other classmates. Uh, either within our course or within the other courses that I teach. Specifically to our course 194, you have a text channel that is meant for just this class. Anything live stream will be posted here. So for example, uh, the Zoom uh, chat is saved as a text file. So I'll just upload the text file in here. Any links that I talk about I will add into this channel so you can refer to it back. So I'll start with week one links. And then as we go along, I'll throw in links in there. And then you have a voice channel to talk amongst this class. And on the right side, you see who is active and who is not. There are tons of other uh, trainings or, or introductions to how to use Discord, but that's basically how you use it. You go into one of these channels and you say hello and everybody there will get it. And then you can communicate amongst each other. You can message someone specifically by using the at sign and then you pick the person uh, or the group. Yours will look a little different. From my point of view, I see everybody. So you can change, so you can see who you see and message amongst each other. But this is meant to be a, a platform for you to collaborate and work with each other and help each other out. I am pretty active in it. So uh, the best way to reach out to me, like during my office hours or uh, while, I, you know, while I'm out and about is through Discord. And to answer this person's question, where's the Zoom meeting number? It, the link is in the announcements on Discord. Um, any questions about the overall orientation of the course? Either through the Zoom chat, through Discord chat, or uh, by microphone. Any questions on how this is going to work? Cool. So let me stop this recording and go over here. And convert this video. So what I'll, I'll be doing is making little videos of everything. So if you miss a specific portion, you can go back to it. It also gives us a little break in between recordings.
And I'll start a new share to that. So I'll take that, open, and then we'll see CS 194 orientation. Set the playlist 194. Done. Not made for kids. and publish. Cool, so while that moves on. All right, now we all have technical issues. Murphy always shows up. All right, so while that processes, we'll start this. So here is our first chapter of three for this week for uh, Windows. This is a pretty easy chapter. These three chapters are pretty easy. Uh, there's nothing too heavy. If you've never ever seen Windows in your life, then maybe this will be earth shattering. Uh, but for most of us, it's stuff you've seen before. Uh, so Windows comes in many different flavors. And not, I mean, not many, not like Linux, uh, but you have what, six versions up here, six, seven uh, different versions. One thing that they do share in common is they all have the same core. So whatever affects one version of Windows affects all of the different versions of Windows, including server. They are all made from the same core. So they all share the same vulnerabilities, the same, uh, the same issues. So if, if you see something that's affecting a Windows 10 version, then it, it affects them all. Uh, the, other diff the difference between them all is what they can do, their features. So home is the one that has the least amount of features, whereas uh, enterprise and ultimate have the most. So here's some basic things of what home has. Professional has more things like it can support up to two terabytes of RAM. It does uh, Hyper-V, whereas home didn't. It can join a domain, whereas uh, the home cannot. Uh, the enterprise has the same things as professional along with these items like direct access, app locker, branch cache, and so forth. Education is basically enterprise without the long-term service branch feature. And it has uh, uh, licensing that's different from enterprise. 
mobile, which uh, we haven't quite seen a lot anymore. That, but that's a version. And M and K are two specific uh, versions that are, one is sold in countries where they can't use Windows Media Player, which is no longer around, by the way. And the K, which is only sold in South Korea. So since Windows 10 uh, came out, it has a number of features. So now some of these we've already seen around and they're not necessarily new. Uh, so for example, Windows 10 is still able to run as 32-bit, even though everybody's getting away from that. Uh, everybody is going 64-bit only, which can hold more RAM, which can process more data. A passport is still a feature that exists in the Microsoft realm. It's their version of a multi-factor authentication. So adding things like pins or connecting it with Active Directory, that kind of stuff. Uh, the Windows Store, which uh, familiar with for either good reasons or bad, um, that's been around since for Windows 10. Microsoft Edge, which is dying. And here's my first link for you. If you didn't already hear in the news, it is going to die. Really leaving only three browsers around, leaving Chrome with its Chromium base, Safari with its WebKit, and uh, Firefox. I don't remember what their core is, but it's really down to three browsers now. Cortana, the wannabe Siri and Google Assistant. Windows Update, which you are not able to turn off. Oh, and here's a link on if you want to uninstall Cortana. Opera is based in Chromium, so I do not see it as a separate browser. Uh, when it comes to updating, you should always install thing, uh, any of the updates that are important or critical. You should know which updates are because it has happened and it continues to happen when updates uh, don't quite do their job and instead mess things up. And the last thing you want is to install updates that will destroy your system or your infrastructure and have to spend time rolling back. Uh, the one of the links that I uh, put in is for the Internet Storm Center. They do a great job of posting a chart with uh, what updates should you install. Like this is critical, so you probably should get this installed. Uh, some that are less important, you can you can pick and choose, so on and so forth. You want to have a good resource. Uh, to find out what updates need to be installed and which ones can, can wait, installing all the criticals right away. There's the easy upgrade, which will help you upgrade from something like Windows 10 Home to Professional or Enterprise, updating the license. There's Continuum, which is basically their, uh, their touch screen, the touch screen function. That's called Continuum. It's used in, in a Surface if you have it. And, there's, and then here's the list of common items that you see all the time when you're on a Windows desktop, the lock screen, the start menu, the search interface, the taskbar. Again, these are things that if you've ever worked with Windows for a while, you know where they are and what they do. Oh, that's a horrible lock screen. <laughs> uh, the start. Oh, these pictures messed up. Let's see. Do I have the? Yes, I do. So let's scroll. This is slide twenty-two. 
scroll down to slide 22. Aha, much better. So let's share screen. There we go. Oh, might have messed it up. Much better. There's your lock screen. If you didn't know what that's called, that's exactly what it's called is the lock screen. The start menu, which we have seen since Windows 95 and keeps changing in every iteration of Windows. The search interface, which used to be run and now has become search. Our taskbar, where we have all our, our buttons to represent uh, shortcuts or any previews that we want. The notification area on the bottom right that has the action center and all kinds of stuff that uh, all the programs are running in the background. And then some, uh, some features of Windows, of the UI, of like when it snaps, you can snap a, a window to be resized automatically. You can shake it or see the task view. Is your taskbar. If you didn't know what it's called, it's called the taskbar. Windows 10 does have some hardware requirements. It can't necessarily run on anything and everything. So you need at least 32 or 64 bit, one gigahertz or faster, one gig of RAM, 16 gigs of disk space, and a video card. While it does do system on a chip like a Raspberry Pi, it's not necessarily the strongest system running on a Pi. Uh, for most processors, especially modern uh, CPUs, they all have things like multitasking and can run multiple threads at once. This is what allows our games to run as fast as possible. Uh, some things that are tied with Windows specifically is like the uh, what is considered quantum, and you see this in the, like the task manager, uh, the time window a thread is allowed to run, uh, the, what the how the thread is restricted to which CPU. It is possible to say uh, Microsoft Word will only run on CPU zero, whereas uh, Firefox can work on on cores two and three. Most, if not all, Windows programs use dynamic link libraries, which is important to secure because it is possible to inject code into these libraries and have multiple programs run in secure code. Um, it used to be that processors were only one, and now we have hyper-threading and multiprocessing, which Windows can take advantage of as a modern operating system. So it supports multiple processors. If you have more than one processor on the system, like a server and multi cores, which we're used to on our end, end machines. They also support plug and play. This is what allows you to plug in a USB drive without having to turn off the whole system and turn it back on again. It has power management features. Which again, a lot of this stuff just sounds like, yeah, I know it's it existed, but you know, it didn't quite exist. It's taken some iterations to get all this stuff refined and, and appear in OSs. Uh, tablet, mostly the surface, but it is possible to run Windows 10 on a tablet. Like I said, Windows Media Center has died has been replaced by something else. I don't actually know off the top of my head, mostly because I don't run Windows. I run Linux on my systems. Uh, Windows 10 can handle SATA, SCSI, or USB. And let me know if you find a modern machine with SCSI. I SCSI does not count. But it also supports virtual hard disks. And uh, of course, it supports the Microsoft, uh, the the Microsoft, not VMDK, uh, VHD. Uh, SAS is serial attached SCSI. No, I mean SCSI SCSI. 
the one that had the huge plug. Uh, disks, when it comes to disks, we have, uh, it has to have a firmware that works with it. So it, you can't necessarily use an old school drive. It has to be somewhat modern to work with this OS. We have our BIOS, which it is now referred to as the old school, if you say a BIOS versus UEFI, which is the newer alternative. Uh, Windows supports FAT32 and NTFS. NTFS has been around for a gajillion years and hasn't been updated, yet it, Windows still supports it. XFAT, it was supposed to replace FAT32, but it hasn't really taken off as much. Uh, the NT file system, it, when it came out, it was a good idea because it had things like secure storage. It could do things like file encryption. Uh, the thing with it is it hasn't changed since it got updated. So a lot of tools can break NTFS. One of the biggest problems of Windows 10 is it works with legacy applications. So as an attacker, finding a way to downgrade, to run something old that doesn't have all the securities that exist, uh, currently makes Windows 10 vulnerable. You can run a application as far back as 95. This is useful for some places. I used to help out a company who did uh, did custom headlights for uh, for motorcycles, and they actually use DOS in order to send the 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 schematic to the machine to mill it. Uh, the compatibility troubleshooter. Anybody actually use this thing with success? <laughs> All right. It's a good idea, but eh, not, uh, not as successful as it should be. Client Hyper-V. Uh, truth be told, in the industry, you're going to see more Hyper-V than VMware, especially in small shops, because Hyper-V comes with Windows, whereas VMware, you have to pay like $3,000 for a license. So I would suggest learning how to use Hyper-V, and that is a portion of this course is uh, covering Hyper-V. Then there's uh, some ways to connect with Windows. Please do not use remote desktop. That is vulnerable. There are tools that are looking for any system that has RDP open to the web and, and actively exploiting. Please do not use RDP. And if you have to use RDP, at least use a VPN. Please do not use RDP. Or use another tool that encrypts your, uh, your traffic. Same with remote assistance. Both of these were not built with security in mind. Uh, this password can be cracked. So please don't trust that just because it says it has generated a password is secure. Home groups have been around since Windows 7, so that uh, a small group of computers can share a stuff kind of like a peer-to-peer -peer and a mix of the domain controller without having a domain controller. Semi-useful, but if you're sharing stuff amongst each other, I mean, it's easier to have every control using a domain. And speaking of, if you have uh, a Windows machine, and it is not joined to a domain, it is by default part of a workgroup called workgroup. And let me tell you from a security standpoint, the world knows this. So if somebody is trying to get into a system, 
they're gonna try the work group called work group because not many people change that and you should change that. Uh, managing a work group model does get difficult when you have more uh, than 10 systems because every system is sharing their own resources. So if you have 10 people working at 10 different systems and they have to change around, you have to make 10 accounts at each of them in order to uh, have give access to everybody. That's where things get nuts. Work groups are fine, I would say with five computers, no more. The domain model has one system that watches over all of them. So it implements, for example, users. You create a user on the domain controller and that user gets propagated out to all the other users. And when you make a change in the policies, that will get disseminated to all the other systems so you don't have to touch each and every single one. This is a good system to centralize management of all your Windows boxes. Uh, same when you share resources like printers and file sharing and all that. Uh, they use Active Directory, a system that's been around since Windows NT, still used by Microsoft, even on its uh, on Azure. So you can join devices now to a cloud Azure Active Directory. So you're not maintaining everything locally. You can also add your mobile devices to it in order to control all of them in one place up on the cloud. Again, peer-to-peer -peer networking can be done with a small number of machines, but once you get too big, then it just becomes hard to maintain and control. And it's better to go with a domain at that point. Any questions about this chapter? Okie dokie. Delete that because I don't need that anymore. And convert. Wonder why this I just downloaded the thing. I don't know why the picture did not work. Ooh. So I went, let's try this again. I download the PDF and I say open with Firefox. Let's see if that messed it up. Yes, it did. All right, well, I guess I'll just be using this instead. The recording's at 14%, so I think we can take a little stretch break while it processes. Uh, does anybody need an ad code? I think we're fine. I don't think anybody's on a wait list. Need an ad code. Um, okay, send me a direct message on Discord what your Cabrillo ID is. And I will give you an ad authorization. 
Yeah, send me a direct message on Discord with your uh, with your student ID. And we'll get that squared away. Copy that, go here, search, add, yes. There you go, I gave an ad code to one student. Uh, this code is to join the class. Eighty one percent. <laughs> okay, now upload video. question yeah are you going to be getting us set up as well today with a uh, net lab um, I will be doing that over over discord awesome just because doing it through here in the live zoom will just will be nutty and it's better to have some order Sounds good. all right so that's uploading so now we can do the next chapter Okay, chapter two of three, installing Windows, because this is so difficult. <laughs> uh, if you ever install like DOS or 3.1, this is a piece of cake. Uh, so Windows 10 comes in three ways to install, either by an optical disk, but that takes like 40 minutes to an hour. You can do it a uh, distribution share or image base. So distribution will be like network and image will be uh, copying it from one drive to another. The oldest way that you can still install Windows is by a DVD boot installation. Like I said, it takes about 40 minutes or so to install. Um, it takes a while. Pretty slow for our standards now. 
Whereas distribution, you can have it running a Windows PE over removable storage or running over the network, sending the files across the network uh, to install. So the DVD boot install would be, uh, would be like ISO. This would not be ISO. This would be using it like a WIM file, a WIM file. And then you have the image based, which is the fastest because you can transfer like from one, one hard drive to another. Uh, Windows 10 can be installed in one of two ways, either a clean installation where everything gets wiped out or in place, which can be, can break things or be fine depending upon what programs are installed and the configurations and the features that exist. So this it, in place can be a risky thing. Uh, sometimes it works just fine, sometimes not. Whereas clean install will wipe everything and start brand new. Uh, they recommend in place upgrades. Uh, like when you when Windows 10 came out, uh, everybody who had Windows got a little notification saying, hey, install Windows 10 through a Windows update. Uh, that, that worked for a while. Actually, the first time it came out, I remember there being news articles of it collapsing on systems. Like if it didn't have enough hard drive space, it would freak out. So you can upgrade. Well, is an in-place upgrade, migrating your user settings, your files and applications. Again, some applications may not like it and freak out. Uh, others may just work just fine when you upgrade. To get to 10, the oldest system you can have is Windows 7 or Service Pack 1. So anything older than that will not work. Or if you have Windows 8, it has to be 8.1 not Windows 8. Clean installations are the easiest because we don't care what was on the system. We're wiping all that out and starting brand new. If you're migrating users, know that all your users exist in the users folder and each user has their own directory you'll need to point that out during the upgrade process. Ideally, before you actually do the operating system upgrade, you're gonna want to get your users off the system using something like the USMT tool or literally copying the, the directory that has the users, but it's better to use a tool that'll capture everything, including the hidden files and all other directory settings. Uh, you can do an, an a attended installation where the thing will, where you enter information at the beginning and then let the rest be handled by the system. Activation, because this is Windows, you have to activate. You can't, you can't just run it with a forever today without a license. Not, this is not Linux. You'll need to do that. If you don't do it after a while, then you'll lose some features. So it kind of bugs you and is annoying until you up until you activate the the operating system. You can do this in different ways. The easiest is online, and that's either through using a multiple activation key that you bought, uh, the key management service that you got with your Windows Server or using Active Directory to manage and control the licenses of the systems that you control. Uh, you can use the assessment and deployment kit that Microsoft has to help you uh, run a number of tools over systems to automate the deployment of installing Windows 10 to many systems at once will make your life easier as admins. So you can pick and choose the things that you want to run. 
like, hey, I want all my users to be migrated, make a uh, the image design, any uh, pre-installation environment that's Windows PE. Like I said, this creates your Windows image format or WIM image. This is what you'll use to deploy out to multiple systems. It's kind of like a, uh, like if you took a, a backup, a complete backup of a system. But when the WIM format is used by Windows's tools to send out these images to systems. Kind of like Acronis has their uh, extension for their backups and, and Norton has theirs. You know, Microsoft is WIM. Windows PE is a limited version of Windows. Um, it, it can do a couple of things. Uh, it's what you see when you boot a DVD. It is a version of Windows, just really minimized. Um, yes, you can include post-install. So that's, that's part of that image and configuration designer where here's Windows and install these other packages along with it. Um, like I mentioned earlier, the user state migration tool is a tool that, uh, that will help you in getting, getting users' profiles off of one box and getting it into another. It puts it all into, a, into one file that you can just copy the one file over rather than moving folders over and making sure you got all the registry entries and, and everything else that is tied to the one user. A volume activation will help you in doing things like activating Windows and Microsoft Office all at once. Although now that we use Office 365 and it's on the cloud, not necessarily need it for Microsoft Office. And you have some performance and assessment toolkits that go with it. The unattended, that's the one that you run using a what's called an answer file. The answer file has all the information needed for the install process. It's in XML format that the, the installer will read and use everything that's within it to do everything. So like what, uh, what size of the, uh, what should Windows partition size be? What should the name of the computer be? What domain should it be part of? All that kind of stuff. Everything that you would normally do, uh, you would put all that stuff in that answer file and then it would do it all for you. There are a number of places that setup looks for this answer file. Um, when you run setup, you can do the slash unattended argument so that it knows I'm going to run in an unattended way. Here is all the places that the Windows installer looks for a answer file with the system drive being the very last one. Um, all your answer files are normally cached in the, whenever you see this, by the way, this is a variable for the folder because sometimes it Windows is not installed in C drive Windows. It might be somewhere else. So in order to not assume that it's in one place, uh, you can use this variable format and Windows will know where it where itself is installed. Um, ideally, when you use the answer file, you want to have all the questions answered so you don't bother with it. So it answers everything and, and does all the work for you. But yes, if, if some questions are not answered, it will, uh, it'll prompt you to say, hey, you need to answer this question because I don't have the answer to it. So here's uh, the basic configuration. There are a number of steps that need to be taken in order to install Windows. So like I said, the partition and format of the disk, uh, where will Windows be installed? 
any default credentials, uh, uh, the product key, the computer name, and any specific commands during the setup. Right, if you have different systems with different drive sizes, you could leave that question out. And you, you would have to go to each individual system and touch the boxes. Uh, there's offline servicing as well as part of this basic process. So you have a few more items to do. If you've ever seen OOBE, it stands for the out of box user experience. It's a, it's, it takes over when you do that a second uh, restart and it's asking for more things. And that's where things like sysprep come in uh, to help in installing uh, Windows. The sysprep is normally what you use when you have your golden image. You install Windows, you set it up just the way you want it, just the way that you want it copied out to many systems. Then you use the sysprep utility to make that that image in order to send out to multiple systems. Uh, so yeah, so these configurations will be passed over to sysprep so that when it's time to run the installer, it'll do it all at once. So if you're doing a basic installation, these are all the steps that you have to do. If you're doing it through sysprep, here is what it looks like. Much simpler because you're automating a lot of the process and you're getting it set up ahead of time. Uh, the system image manager helps you create and modify any answer files used in unattended. Uh, it's basically like the, uh, the repository when uh, the Windows installer looks for where is the answer file and pull that and then use that to answer all the questions. So you can put it out on the network and it'll, it'll pull from there. Which is great if you're doing this often and you make updates like what uh, maybe all the systems have a new hard drive so you want to set that up everywhere. So when it updates, it'll handle all that at once. You know, it helps in the automating process. So here's some answer file settings that you can set up. It's kind of small, but you can see it better uh, if you look at the, uh, the file yourself. These configuration sets are subsets of files that are required for a particular answer file. So for example, if we're talking about uh, installing service packs, drivers, or other programs, those need to be as part of that configuration set so it knows where to pull from. Um, in an image-based image uh, system, it is the fastest because like I said, for image-based, we're going to take one hard drive that has everything done and we're just going to make a clone of it and go on from there. And sysprep can be used so that when the system turns on, sysprep will run to change the computer name so it's not the same as the image it cloned from and do any third party settings at the end. Yeah, just like I said, we make our, our golden image, we use sysprep to generalize and prepare it. And then we capture on the destination, we run Windows PE and we send that image over. Sysprep is great to say, like, our computer names will start with company name, dash, and then a number, and pick a number from this and up. Any specific data that's tied to one computer will be wiped out, like the MAC address. It'll be different for each machine, so Windows don't record the one from the golden image because you'll use a different one. 
As always, they'll look for the unattended XML answer file in order to run. And there are cleanup actions that it can do at the end. Like, hey, we're at the end, uh, we're gonna generalize our, our out-of-box experience and we're gonna shut down the computer when we're completely done. Maybe because we're gonna do this on a Friday night so that by Monday, all the systems are updated and they're ready to go. Uh, SysPrep doesn't work completely out of the box. You need to ensure that the drivers uh, have plug and play support on the destination computer. You can't just assume. And it also can reset the activation clock a maximum of three times if you're trying to use this as a way to get around using Windows or actually buying a Windows license. SysRep will only help you up to three times. Also, if it's part of a domain, uh, it'll remove the computer from the domain. SysPrep does not like to run on upgraded computers. So here's another argument to use a clean install. And any encrypted files and folders that were encrypted using Windows, like the EFS uh, system, they'll become unreadable because the keys are tied to a user. And since SysPrep generalizes everything, you will lose those files. So warning, if you're thinking about using SysPrep, make sure you don't have anything encrypted uh, there because it will become unreadable. And here's some uh, options that go with using SysPrep, which you can pull from running SysPrep slash help. Uh, DSIM, like I said, it makes that WIM file and that can hold multiple images, like capturing uh, one partition and restoring it to another. Or you could take an entire partition or just a specific folder. It's a, it's a little more nuanced in how you can use it. They can also be compressed, which is great if you have a lot of images. You, you want to maximize your storage. Uh, these files can be mounted to a folder so you can edit them later. Can't quite do that with a standard image because then the image doesn't check some properly, but you can make these changes and not harm the, the whole uh, file that you'll use to make copy later. And these can be used to automate your, uh, your process. The SIM is part of command line. So you'll need to use command line syntaxes in order to use it. Here's some options that'll go with it. A few more. Um, image maintenance, because as you know, updates come out all the time and you want to keep your images up to date whenever you need to re-image a system. You'll definitely need to do that often, making sure that all your device drivers are up to date, your updates are in place, any features that are necessary are running, uh, so on and so forth. Windows PE, which has been talked about, the pre-installation environment. You see it when you run from a Windows ISO or a, a optical disk. You can use it to mount things like a WIM file. Uh, to provision Windows, there is a new tool as part of that kit that you can use to provision not only already installed copies, but new copies. So this is great if uh, you're bringing, you're buying new computers from manufacturers or, or you have people bringing in their own devices. And you can add these as packages that'll have to run on those devices. 
Windows to go is a portable version of Windows 10, fully functional on a USB, although I don't know how well it'll run running from USB long-term. The idea of it really is this, is here, everybody, here's a USB stick, run boot to this and it'll have all the programs and everything you need to connect to us, to the company network and be able to do everything. Uh, you will need a WIM file. The disk has to be at least 25 gigabytes. Obviously that, that USB drive can't have any data. You can use BitLocker to encrypt, but then you need to uh, remember that, that that's how you're gonna need to unencrypt it later. So you'll need to suspend BitLocker on the destination system if you're running Windows to go on a USB stick that has BitLocker encrypted. Any questions? Oh, I see some in the chat. Uh, when I made a Windows 10 installer, one of the options was Windows 10 single language. You mean like what, what language? You press it. It's part of. It's probably part of the XML. Okay, I'll stop this recording. And while it converts, I'll get a water bottle. Feel free to stretch around a bit. It'll take, what, about five minutes or so. So I'll be right back. Um, if you're at a repair shop and have to reinstall Windows 10 the exact same way, as long as the image has the drivers, it should work. Oh, all part of the post install, then yeah. Then it should work. As long as Windows is able to get the drivers you need 
from Windows Update, then you should be able to use an image and just hit that on all the drives that you're going to uh, move into the systems you're refurbishing. Uh, the other thing that you need to think about when you're refurbishing a system is the, uh, the license. Because if you're not using a license on these refurbished systems because you want the person who's going to buy it to purchase a license, then you, know, you need to take that out of your answer file. Oh man, that sounds like fun. Yeah, OEM license is fine because it's tied to that, that system. Yay, all done. Upload. Uh, Week one, chapter two, added to 194. Next, not made for kids. Next, next, public, publish. Yeah, doing things netboot would would definitely make your life uh, easier. Okay, so while that's running, we can now do the last chapter. And then after that, we'll go over the assignment or the stuff that you'll need to do uh, this week. And then we'll call it a day. So we'll what, end by like 3.30ish? Not bad. Okay, chapter three, last chapter. Using the system utilities. Um, in security, this is living off the land. So most configurations you can get through settings. Settings is taking over the control panel. So if you're used to control panel, you'll need to get used to settings. That's what it looks like. I highly suggest getting familiar with this and using everything that's here and not so much the control panel, because my guess is either if it's not the next edition of Windows, it might be an update when they'll remove the control panel completely. 
Uh, you have all your same settings as you would in control panel. They just are sorted in a different way, but it, it is the control panel's new version, kind of like my uh, Internet Explorer and, and Edge. So like, for example, in within devices, you have all your devices, kind of like how Android and iOS have things divided out. Network and internet has everything that's in that realm from Wi-Fi, airplane, VPN, ethernet. Personalization handles the background, the colors, the lock screen. Your accounts, anything that you've connected out, like your Microsoft account. Time and language, pretty self-explanatory. Ease of access, your narrator, your magnifier, all that kind of stuff is hidden here, along with your mouse and keyboard. Uh, the privacy has what can run in the background, what, uh, what can Microsoft send for diagnostic purposes. Updating security has your Windows update, has your backup, has your activation that kind of stuff. Your administrative tools. This is something that you should be familiar with. They are still found as the Microsoft Management Console. It has all the possible options to edit Windows. So things like the Event Viewer, the Local Security Policy, the Performance Manager, the Services. Uh, the task scheduler, any uh, memory diagnostic, these are important tools that you need to be familiar with. In the control panel, they used to be under system security and then admin tools. You can also call them out by running the, the MMC itself. Definitely something that you need to be familiar with. It is a graphical user interface. It is not uh, just based in uh, text, although you can run it through the command line. Here is the computer management. Uh, computer management tends to have uh, everything that you need in order to to do your work. So for example, the task scheduler, event viewer, shared folders, so on and so forth. All these items are already here under one roof. And then if you need to add more, you can add more snap-ins. That's what each of these is called. The computer management tends to have everything you need from the disk to the services and so on for you to use uh, ready to go. Like I just said, you can make your own by adding snap-ins into a single console and then saving it later. You don't have to save it. You can't just create on the fly. There are different modes. So if for whatever reason a user needs access to them who's not an administrator, you can limit what they can see and do. Because ideally you don't want users to have full access to the system and be able to make any and all changes that they want. Uh, just in the couple slides before, you saw what the console looks like. You can choose a variety of items, the most commonly used, the performance device manager, so on and so forth. Your service, these are background applications. This is what lets you get an IP address uh, to get DNS resolution, to print. Uh, this, these background services are essential to keep the computer running. If a service is, is running that's using a lot of CPU power, you don't know where it's coming from, you might want to check your services to see is there something that shouldn't be running here that is running in the background. This is what it looks like. Here are some of the most uh, common ones that you see in any Windows installation. You see the status, if they are running or not. You see, do they start up automatically or do they start when there's a trigger? Like if I'm going to print something, that's when the service activates because I'm going to print, otherwise it should stay off. And what uh, user account do they use to run under? Are they running as a local system? 
are they running as a network, uh, a network account, or are they running as a specific user? In the properties, you can also you can define uh, many items uh, regarding each service. Like a service has to depend on another service to run. A lot of them run on Microsoft RPC. So if that's not running, a series of services won't be able to run. A hardware management handles the physical hardware of the system. This is where the device drivers communicate with the hardware and the operating system. Your device drivers are basically your, uh, your translators between the hardware, the physical hardware, and the operating system and the programs that run within it. So you definitely want to make sure you have the proper drivers installed and that they're up to date. For example, uh, if you have a 64-bit system, you shouldn't be running 32-bit drivers. You should run 64-bit because it's native to that operating system. Um, all the drivers should have an INF file if you're looking for them. Um, nowadays, this is necessarily so much a problem because you get your drivers from Windows Update, which are already verified and run on the proper OS. So this, is, this isn't necessarily a big problem as it used to be. Uh, some compatibility issues if you're installing, if you're upgrading from like XP, they won't be compatible. Uh, there are you know, like kernel mode printer drivers that used to exist in older versions. They won't run on this anymore. The device manager will tell you what devices are, are connected that Windows sees and it, it did install the right driver or is there's a problem with it. May not give you the best explanation as to why something isn't running, but at least you can pinpoint to a specific piece of hardware. So some things that you can do, enabling, disabling, or uninstalling devices, you can change like the printing summaries, uh, you can configure some advanced settings if they so exist. Here's the properties for the driver uh, for a, a dual band AC wireless card. Your driver should be signed so you know that you're installing them from a valid source. The last thing you want is to install a driver that is from a sketchy place and you get yourself infected or worse. Uh, Windows does make a stink if you're trying to install a driver that hasn't been verified, which is good. This is a good thing. Even with our current modern systems, they still rely on direct memory access, on input output ranges, on interrupt requests, because this is just how the hardware functions. So you will never get away from this kind of stuff. And this is generally what the BIOS and Windows together figure out, or what, how does a program access memory, uh, what ways can we get information in and out? Uh, this used to be a thing. Most USB drivers now work universally. So you don't necessarily have to worry so much, but if something is asking, something that shouldn't be asking for a driver is asking for a driver, that to me would be a red flag because maybe this device has been modified in a way that it installs something and now there's a back door. Uh, power management is a feature of all modern OSs in order to minimize power usage. There are different states that you should be familiar with, like the S0 
a fully functioning system, an S3 is suspended to RAM, or is S4 suspended to disk? S5, the OS isn't running. G3 is uh, mechanically off. Every, all the power has been turned off. Windows 10 uses a combo of S3 and S4 called hybrid. Uh, the advantage is if it loses power, it doesn't destroy everything. And it does enable uh, the leaving to standby to enter into hibernation. Can't have a perk. Uh, your modern standby, it provides that instant on as soon as you open up. If it's a laptop, you open up your screen, it comes back to life. You wiggle the mouse, it comes back. And it's not necessarily off, but it's not necessarily on, but it is quick to answer back. There is an option called fast startup. So if a user logs off and hibernates, it can quickly resume instead of taking forever in a day to load. Um, but if it does become unstable and it's Windows, so it just might, you'll need to complete a restart in order to get everything back up and running. Here's your default power plans, the balance, the power saver, and the high performance. And this is what uh, goes with each and every one of those. So if something is in high performance, it will never go to sleep and never hibernate. Whereas if it's balanced, it'll sleep after 30 minutes on an AC. Uh, but if it's on battery, it'll go to sleep after 15 minutes. The away mode is basically the S0 state. It looks like and sounds like it's off. Minimizing your uh, device, level, device level power settings. You can use a command line to edit this, the powercfg.exe. Your display which you are using if you're on Windows and you have a GUI running, has uh, the display driver and DirectX. Windows 10, uh, don't use arrow glass that you saw in Windows 7, although some of those features still exist. You can do your standard things like uh, changing your, uh, your resolution and that kind of stuff, calibration. Here's some of the visual effects that you can edit. Desktop backgrounds, which all we can all know how to change. Screen saver, same thing. To increase security, by the way, this is a good thing. You shouldn't just let the system let you log back in when you go into a sleep mode or, or when it locks. It should ask you for a password to log back in. This is a good thing. There's the option in the screensaver settings. Please make sure that that is on. You don't want someone jumping into your system after the fact because it wasn't logged in. Uh, computers used to not support multiple logins or uh, multiple monitors, sorry, but now they do. You can also use multiple desktops with a single monitor kind of like Linux and Mac do. Windows copied them. You have the task scheduler to automate tasks when you want them. So at 10 o'clock restart or at 10 o'clock run this backup, run this program, this, that, or the other. You can do all that within task scheduler. PowerShell is something we will dig into further uh, in the course. You should know how to use PowerShell. It is basically like the bash of Windows. You can do a number of scripts, automate a number of tasks. You can do more than what you can do with the command line in PowerShell. It, it, to me, it is weird because you have to use like get dash, set dash, or remove dash. It's, uh, it's a weird verb noun format. Uh, but you should know how to use PowerShell 
because you can get a lot of work done, you can automate a lot of work done by using PowerShell scripts. Each item that it can do is called a commandlet. So if you wanted to find out the IP address, it would be something like get IP address. And that commandlet has a certain way that it requests how uh, you, you give it arguments and how it's going to work. Kind of like, like in Linux with Bash, you, every program has a certain way of functioning. Um, and most windows come with the ISC, or you can install the ISC in order to uh, make edits to a PowerShell script, or you can also just do it in Notepad and then execute it. This is what the Windows PowerShell ISC looks like. Any questions? Cool. Then let's stop the recording and delete this file and start converting and see if I uh, screwed up making videos. Well, so far so good. Yeah, by command line, I mean cmd.exe. Forty-two percent. Now let's switch this over to here for the last section. Um, to recover from the GUI crashing, it I think it's ex if you have to run explore.exe. And the way that I've done it is going is uh, opening up the task manager, which I think is Control Shift Escape, and then uh, running a new command and saying explore.exe. But it doesn't. It doesn't have another TTY, like Linux does. Right. But to my knowledge, there isn't another way.
uploading the file. Week one, chapter three, add it to 194, not made for kids. Public, publish. Excellent. All right, last section. Okay, so this video will cover over what you'll need to do this week. In the module, you have the overview that'll go over what, what will be covered this week. You have the, the three PDFs that you can download yourself uh, that are tied to the, the three videos we just did. There is a lecture review. So three questions or four questions, I'm sorry, from each chapter that you'll need to answer and submit them right here. So for example, if you're answering 1.1, 1 .1, 1 .1 is already highlighted, you put your name and what the answer is and it'll tell you if you got it right or wrong. And then you'll flip to 1.2 to answer uh, that one and so on and so forth all the way till you finish. Uh, all, oh, I need to make uh, two and three appear. So I will fix that. So you'll see uh, two, uh, 2 2.1 through three. You have a assignment where you'll connect to NetLab and do these five labs and submit a document that shows the steps you took in completing the lab. I will be sending out a message on Discord to say, hey, I have your uh, account ready. Uh, if, I, if you are taking this class through my, uh, my Canvas that's not Cabrillo's, you will need to send me your email address in order to get a, uh, a credential into NetLab. If you are a Cabrillo College student, you, I will uh, let you know ahead of, you know, I'll let you know that it's ready. So if I do not have your email address because you're not registered through Cabrillo, you need to send that to me so that you'll get access. Otherwise, by default, all Cabrillo College students will get access to NetLab right away. And you'll have five labs to work through. And there is also a quick quiz that is tied to the three chapters we just covered. So those are the three things you'll need to do this week. There's the lecture review, the module one assignment, and the module one quiz. Again, I'll fix why, uh, why this is not showing in the dropdown two and three. That'll be a quick and easy fix. Any questions on your work this week? And if you're formulating a question, please do so. The, the last thing that I want to point out to you is the due dates. So down here, for example, the module one assignment submission there is a due date of September 6th. It's been available since today. But the big thing that I want you to know is this, the do until. I understand that life happens and that you'll need to take care of life over this course. You have until December 15 at midnight to submit any and all the assignments. So if you are, if something happens this week that you are not able to do your work, do not fret that I'm going to, to remove points because it's late. That's not how I function. If you didn't or you couldn't submit it by September 6th, you don't worry about it. Yes, you will get full credit up to this day, this time. Because again, I understand life happens. 
So do not worry if you are not able to submit uh, this week or any week from here till that day. Now, when we reach December 15, 11, 59, I won't accept any assignments because we'll, we'll hit that hard deadline. But you are able to submit any assignments late and not get reduced points. So don't, don't let that be another stress to your life because I get it. And I want to be as helpful to you guys as possible. So, so just know on all the assignments, this is true, that there is a due until date of December 15. Should you not be able to submit on the due date, Submit when you can, and I'll grade it, and we'll, and life is peachy. But when we hit December 15, nothing will be accepted. So you have the full 16 weeks to submit everything. And yes, this is true for all my classes. So if you're in, mo in more than one of, one of these classes, you'll hear me repeat this over and over. <laughs> Um, I see a question. Uh, taking the, the taking this class through my Canvas portal and not through Cabrillo is that a free option? That is a free option, and it does include access to NetLab as long as you email. If you send me your email address through Discord. Uh, my office hour, just to, just to reiterate from the beginning, my office hours tend to be 10 to 2, and they are through Discord. So feel free to send me a message on Discord or just use the, the class text. I watch everything. Uh, so if you put a question there, I will be sure to answer it. And definitely feel free to, to work with each other and help each other out. This is a collaborative class. It's not meant to be all done in isolation. If there are no other questions, I will stop this recording. And I will, uh, I will message through Discord when we will meet for next week since Monday is Labor Day. Have a good one, Mr. Urban. I'm sorry? Have a good one. You too. Uh, where can we watch the recordings? Um, I will post the link in Discord. Well, thanks, Urban. Have a good day.